I'm Glenn McGinnis, and this is Outburst. On the program, should alcohol containers include warning labels? As a cancer survivor, I understand the need for that. No, I don't think that we need warning labels on everything that we have in our lives, you know? You see a lot of binge drinking. You see a lot of over-intoxication. I think there should be warning labels on everything. But first, the health care crunch in this country continues as countless Canadians are still without a family doctor and surgical backlogs continue to grow, made worse by the pandemic in an attempt to make things better. The province of Ontario is looking to allow private and public clinics to perform surgeries and other procedures such as knee and hip replacements and cataract surgeries. But while this plan may look good on paper, some critics will argue it will only take workers out of the public health care system, leaving more patients behind. So we took to the streets to see what you think about this. Our question. Is shifting some surgeries to private clinics the right approach to ease our health care crisis? I don't think there's any problem with privatization. I think as long as it doesn't affect the um, the capability of the already the systems that are already in place, right? So if if it, you know, I mean, there's I'm sure there's probably a lot of um, professionals out there that you know we can fill these positions. So um, you know, it, it doesn't make sense that someone should, should have to wait on a huge lineup waiting list to go do a, a surgery that might mean them surviving or not surviving. And if their family or their friends rally up money or whatever it is to, to get that those resources together so that that person can be taken care of, I don't think anyone should ever say, you know, we can't allow, we shouldn't allow that person to do that. that that's, that's, that's freedom. That's free choice. You know, I think for temporarily, yes, because you we've seen during COVID a lot of people with brain aneurysms died because there was a wait waiting time, and as long as OHIP's covering it, I don't really see a problem because people aren't actually paying out of pocket to have these procedures done, and it is a wait limit off of the healthcare system permanently. No, but for the time being to catch up, I think it's a good idea. Like my dad and my sister had to wait over two years to have s surgery, and my dad had to be on short term disability he couldn't do his job anymore and same thing with my sister because of how long it took so some people can't work and they're losing their homes and if it's permanent then i don't really think so but for the time being just to catch up why not however if there's going to be the need to have to pay uh to attend these private clinics i think that we're going to run into some problems because people often who have chronic illnesses um, not everyone, but many people who have chronic illnesses can't work, so they're on a fixed income. Uh, I'm all for it. That's where I stand. And uh, right now, the, our, uh, our system and the medical field is a bit so slightly broken, you could say. But I mean, uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll come around to uh, figure it out. But the privatization of, uh, for knee surgery, shoulder, uh, hip replacement, uh, I think it's a good thing for now and see how that goes. I'm going to have to go with no on that one. I think it's just going to create a whole new set of problems instead of solving a, a problem. Well, I think right now we have to, especially if you're my age. Yes. We need, yeah, we need people to do these surgeries. I feel like it's easy to say that when we have money. People who have money are going to say, of course we should, but then we can't always think about the the minim, the small amount of people that can access those private things. I, I think a solution that is great for all would be the best solution, whether you have or whether we don't have, right? That's the beauty about Canada, that we can all get the same service this, despite our economical, you know what I mean? Despite our social, our social economical statuses, everybody should be able to access any kind of health care. So I think a question like that, like people who have the opportunity to go private will say, for sure. But then what about those who don't? And should they suffer because they don't have it? I think we need to look after our doctors and nurses better and stop seeing them go to the States. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time getting them educated and helping them get them started. And then they get a better offer somewhere else and away they go. So if if we can alleviate some of the stress by having private clinics open up and maybe reduce the demand, it may help. I, I don't see a negative to it. Yes and no. As long as the guidelines are followed properly and it's being insured, it can ease the burden on the healthcare system. 
because unfortunately a lot of people get out of the health care system and work in the private sector because they can make more money. I don't think health care should be privatized. I don't think people should be profiting off of, you know, people with cancer, or people who need heart transplants, stuff like that. I don't think we should ever go in that direction. I think um, free health care or health care that's taken out of our taxes is really important. And I don't want to pay $17,000 to get my appendix removed. Well, because I think the resources from the uh, from the existing system uh, would have to be used to uh, operate it. I feel the same about that. I think that we would we would lose workers in our public system. If somebody can afford it and wants to pay for it, by all means, that frees up a lot more beds for people who can't. When it comes to trying to ease our, our current healthcare crisis with private, I, there's parts of me that say, yes, that that would be a good thing to do. But at the same time, no, I don't want anyone left behind in that same process. I want to make sure that we're all getting it as, as equal as we can. And if it leaves a little bit of for, for now, but there needs to be a bigger solution in the background. This is a long, long answer. Uh, it depends. In some communities, it will shorten the list. In some, it will lengthen it because it depends on uh, manning them or womaning them with um, highly skilled OR nurses, the people who do the sterilization, who really have to know what they're doing, and uh, x-ray technicians and recovery room nurses, as well as anesthesiologists. So if they're short, any of those that are working in the hospital, then um, they'll, They'll take away the ones who are of an age where um, they've got the mortgage paid, the babies are arriving, the grandchildren. And so they're thinking, I don't want to work nights, weekends, Christmas anymore. And here I can work. Easy cases, straightforward, healthy people, uh, eight to four, weekdays only. And I can probably arrange to do just as many days a week as I want in a private clinic. Recent guidelines published by the Canadian Centre for Substance Use and Addiction suggests that more than two alcoholic drinks per week could raise your risk of heart disease, stroke, and even certain cancers. The two-year study was funded by Health Canada and seems to do an about face from a similar study back in 2011, which suggested no more than 10 drinks per week for women and 15 drinks for men. We of course see strict warning labels on cigarette packages and other tobacco products. So should products involving alcohol follow suit? Our question. Should alcohol containers include warning labels? Hey, you know, it's funny you asked that. I, I, I'm on my way to the liquor store next. I, uh... You know, I, I think people are going to do what people do, same as smoking. People that smoke, smoke. People that drink, drink. Um, I'd like to see tougher stances on drinking and driving. I mean, maybe that would be somewhere to focus more so or put more labels about drinking and driving, you know, something to that effect. I think it's important for the public to be aware of, of alcohol as a potential carcinogen. Um, I think what they should go after first would be uh, advertising, advertising on, on television, advertising uh, on the radio in terms of, of uh, you know, alcohol and partying, things like that, before they would plaster things with labels. No, I think people pretty much know the caution around alcohol. Absolutely. I think anything that's not good for you should have as much warning as you could possibly have. I mean, I think people know what they need. They should know the limit. And I know most people don't, but I don't think that's necessary. Just like with cigarettes, like the labels didn't do much. If you want to quit, you quit. Alcohol should, should continue having warning labels. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because alcohol, just like drugs, is a huge problem if it's misused. I think there should be warning labels on everything. Uh, even in finer detail than the finer details, meaning, um, yeah, dextrocarbo, da 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 da. What the hell is that? You gotta tell me what that is and what it's doing to my body. It, this could cause this, this particular ingredient, or whatever it is, whether it's alcohol or it's a can of sardines. 
well, I'm one of the people that has a glass of wine a day. So to bring it down to two a week, which if, it, if it's that dangerous, I feel that even two a week probably is more than anybody should be consuming. It would be comparable to having two cigarettes a week. Maybe not to the extent of, say, like cigarettes with, you see like the packaging with terrible packaging, but, uh, and they probably, alcohol companies won't want to do that. But I don't see why that's a problem. And I actually think it should happen, yeah. Halifax is university city. You see a lot of binge drinking. You see a lot of over intoxication. So I, I, I do think they should have warning definitely. labels. I definitely agree with yeah. her, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Alcohol is a toxin that uh, is dose related and uh, it's neurotoxic and, uh, and uh, hepatotoxic liver and it causes um, uh, fetal alcohol problems. Something like, I may have this figure wrong, it's from years ago, but something like one in 16 or 17 people who ever takes a sip becomes an alcoholic. Yes, definitely. Especially since we see like tobacco industry definitely having the labels on the package right there in front of you. I think alcohol, we've all like grown with it. We all don't second guess it. We don't question it. We just grew up with it. So always. Always. Well, it I think it makes people aware of what's in the alcohol and read. I read all labels. You know, and I am allergic to certain things in certain wines. So if I would prefer some of the wines to also have not how many sulfides or what sulfides are in them, but I would also like to see a percentage of sulfides that go into these things. A lot of the additions to natural products are harmful. Um, I mean, sure, there's no harm in having a warning, right? So, you know, the benefits outweigh the possible cons of people being warned. So I guess it's, sure, why not? No, I don't think that we need warning labels on everything that we have in our lives. You know, it's a life work. There's all kinds of things in life that are dangerous and stuff. Um, I think, you know, it's one of those things that um, when we do stuff like this, it almost takes away the responsibility that we have to carry as adults and stuff and teaching people. And, you know, it's like, oh no, we'll just put it that responsibility on a warning label I, I don't I you know it's, we we need to carry that responsibility as a as a culture as a society right I think so for the people that aren't fully aware of what the repercussions is like I like beer and I didn't know how advanced it was up until that recent study well it might be you know maybe people will think twice about how much they're consuming and and try and protect their health Who was the first black woman elected to the House of Commons? Vivian Barbeau, Marlene Jennings, or Jean Augustine? Barbeau, Jennings, or Augustine? Um, Jennings? Let's go with Barbeau. I'm gonna say Augustine. Augustine? Uh, I'll, I'll say Jennings. Jennings, sure. You know what, I'm gonna go with Jean Augustine. I'm gonna go with Jean Augustine. Absolutely correct. Ah! Jean Augustine. I'm actually on her scholarship. Um, yeah, the Center for Women. So hi guys. In 1993, Jean Augustine became the first black woman to be elected to the Canadian House of Commons. She later became the first black woman to be appointed to the federal cabinet under Prime Minister Jean Chrétien and also serving under Prime Minister Paul Martin. Augustine's most notable achievements as a parliamentarian include putting forth the motion to create the famous five statues in Ottawa, as well as the motion to recognize February as Black History Month in Canada. We've recently seen the one year mark since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And in that time, Canada has contributed roughly $1 billion in military assistance in the form of equipment, weaponry, and training. Of course, Canada is not the only country lending a helping hand to the beleaguered nation. Other NATO member countries have, of course, been providing similar assistance to Ukraine, but have been stopping short of putting boots on the ground and are still on the fence about providing military aircraft. So. We took to the streets to ask Canadians what Canada and its allies should be doing 
to end this conflict once and for all. Our question. What must Western countries do to help end Russia's war on Ukraine? I think we have to continue doing what we've been doing, supporting Ukraine in every which way, not letting Russia bully the, the rest of our Western society right now and trying to ensure the safety of, of every, every person who's being affected by this war. I'd like, to, I'd like to see that they could go in there, that other countries could go in there and help Ukraine and bring an end to this war, but I believe in doing that, then uh, we're really, we're really going to be in trouble. It'll be a huge war. So I, I guess I, I have to say, I don't know what should be done. I worry about, I worry about Ukraine and where it could go from there. I don't think any of the Western world can do anything to solve their conflict. They have to come to the negotiating table and they have to work out their problems. And I don't think there's much the Western world can do. I think providing aid to immigrants is a good first step to provide relief to um, a lot of like the really struggling families that are there. Um, but physically stopping the Russian attack, uh, I don't know what the Western countries are obliged or should do. Uh, I wish they'd put troops on the ground right at the beginning. I really do. Right when they started getting, the Russians started getting all the troops on the borders. Oh, I wish somebody had gone in and done something. I feel so badly for those people. To end it, I don't know if, if that's really in our power, but I think we're doing what we can in terms of providing, um, you know, artillery and, 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 and the like. And, um, I don't think we, we, it's in our power to end it. At the end of the day, this is a, a conflict that uh, we have to carefully dabble in because we could cause more war and it could get worse. I don't really have an answer for that. I mean, I think that's why we have governments in place and they should be figuring it out. I grew up in Poland. My mother lived like a hundred kilometers from the you know, Ukraine border. I worry about that too. It's uh, hope, hopefully it's nothing gonna happen like any ever, ever, ever happened like any in the Russia invaded Poland, but you know uh, they, 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 I believe that Canada should help. Like you know, they should help like the weapons pretty much in you know support Ukraine because the whole world is affecting pretty much everybody, right? Support Ukraine as much as they can. Uh, I know Canada just sent those tanks over and stuff like that. Whatever we can do to help, I think we should. So it's almost a year now this has been going on. And um, I feel like it does seem very important to global stability, democracy in general, that those of us who can support Ukraine. I think that what we're doing is very good. I think it's supplying tanks and supplying arms and continuing to supply everything that we, we can do. I think accepting refugees uh, as well. Maybe giving more um, uh, weaponry, I think. You know, we've held back a little bit. Uh, especially the American president and this sort of thing in the European Union. So I think that would be a good start. Um, I think we should do everything possible. Obviously, um, Russia presents a threat to the West. Uh, I think invading a sovereign nation is obviously a very bad thing. So, I mean, whatever we can do to help them and fight back Russia, I think would be really important in our interest as well. I think um, I think it's very important. Um, I mean, it's, it's good that Canada and other European countries, U.S., are contributing, I would say, if anything, um, you know, err on the side of doing more than less. I mean, obviously it has some very, very serious implications. If, uh, you know, if, if we don't stop Russia there, they might, uh, you know, start moving further west. And I mean, it's sort of a, a fight between, you know, democracy and fascism. So yeah, definitely all in on helping the Ukraine, helping Ukraine. We are doing some, but um, I'm really not that, familiar with what we should be doing. Actually, our family is actually helping someone from Ukraine right now, you know, get established in Montreal. But I really don't know. I think it's good that they're, you know, helping with some war supplies so that they can you know, defend themselves. But I, I don't really know too much about it. When Joe Biden makes his first official visit to Canada as U.S. president soon, the two leaders will likely have much to talk about. Topping the list will probably be trade, assisting Ukraine, and even those mysterious balloons that have been showing up in Canadian and American airspace. So we sent our cameras out to ask Canadians what topics should be in the forefront with both leaders. 
our question. What issues do you think Prime Minister Trudeau should raise with U.S. President Biden? Um, climate change, definitely. Um, and I would say trade issues between our countries. And I think I'm actually a dual citizen in both countries myself. So having a good relationship is, is really good between our two countries, in my opinion. I think they should address the refugee crisis. Uh, uh, I know Canada's trying to do, but it's not really doing enough. It's too, it's too bureaucratic to try and get into the country. I think the states could take a lot more people than they are. I think with uh, climate change, I think they need to do more faster. I think uh, they're dragging their heels. I think they should get rid of fossil fuels on, on both sides of the border um, or start winding down. Maybe some of the trade issues relating to the automobile industry, things like that, I think would be a good start. Yeah. Um, I think Ukraine's a really uh, big one right now. Uh, inflation and economic issues are also um, pretty big right now. So I think those should be the two forefront ones. But I think there are obviously um, other like cultural issues that I think could be discussed as well. I mean, climate change, I think, is, is for me, is the number one topic because, you know, if we don't if we don't fix that, nothing, nothing else will matter eventually. Uh, so that's important. And then the, the war in Ukraine again. I mean, I know we're both contributing some tanks now, so, so that's good. You know, we're going towards a recession, so we need to think about the energy um, in Canada and our supply and I think that that's the main question that we should be addressing is, is the trade that Canada and U.S. have together and how we can prioritize the needs of Canadians. We have like NAFTA issues. We have like um, uh, petrol line issues. I don't know what's that in Quebec and we have the border, that the gas issue that we need to start out. The Canadian dollar is always lower than the American dollar. <laughs> and then as a person trying to buy something from American goods or anything like that, I always have to pay more. So I know there's a lot that goes into building the strength of the Canadian dollar, but I guess that's something that Trudeau could aim for. I know the war in Ukraine and all that is bad and everything, but we got to stop sending them all these billions of dollars when we have homeless people and our medical situation is in arrears and the whole thing and housing and everything else, that money needs to, could solve all those problems. That war is going to rage on whether, no matter how much money we throw at it, so I believe uh, that money should stay here and take care of our needs right here, not over there. Basically, the protectionism that Biden has indicated in the past, I don't think that's good for Canada or for the U.S. So I, I think that that's definitely something that should raise with him, yes. Well, I think Biden's being very protective of his economy and his country. And I think Canada is losing ground on a lot of the innovation that they're taking part in and growing their economy, like natural gas, you know. Um, and I think that it is a deficit in Canada. We're going backwards where th that country seems to be moving forward. Uh, I don't know, just uh, bring more jobs here, you know. I think that's just like a working economy, like together, you know, bring the economy up, you know, just people make it, just make it for easier. You know, I, I see the people around the struggling, right? I don't make a bad money, but like it's still, it's tough. Like you look at the price of groceries, it's a little bag, it's almost paid to $40, man. No, I think uh, at this point, economy, <laughs> more than anything else, I think that's what everybody is uh, asking where it's going. And uh, if they can uh, uh, start with, uh, uh, like in the first question, interest rates and uh, see if we can strengthen the economy. So, uh, so inflation is uh, a little bit more controlled, if at all possible. I know it's kind of a uh, two-way road, you know, to uh, developing economy and decreasing the interest rates. But uh, if we can uh, slow it down a little bit, then it'd be a good uh, thing to do. I guess probably helping Ukraine would be probably the best thing that they could work on together and resolving that. I think they need to do something to finish it, get the economy going again with Russia back in the game and supplying oil and doing the things they used to do. It'd be nice to see that over. Trade. Trade is very important. And I think the American government has as many problems as the Canadians. And I think they actually have bigger problems because it seems to be sometimes Mr. Biden seems to be a delusional when you see some of his speeches. I don't know what he's talking about, but trade is the biggest thing because 
I was not a big Trump fan because of his tweeting, but he had got a lot of good policies and he did a lot of deals with his neighbors. And unfortunately, those neighbors have fallen to the wayside. And that's not only the American government's fault, I think it's our government fault too. And COVID didn't help either, but those trades need to be wrapped up again to help both economies. Before becoming the first black player in Major League Baseball, Jackie Robinson played baseball in which Canadian city? Montreal, Vancouver, or Toronto? Montreal. 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 Toronto. Montreal. I want to say Montreal. Vancouver? Yeah. Toronto? I don't even know. Montreal. Toronto. Toronto. I'd say Montreal. Montreal. It's Montreal. Yay! Are you married? Uh, we are. <laughs> yes. Well, you can high five each other then. Okay. I have to take my hand out. Oh, here. come on. A little fist bump too. Come on, come on. There we go. Yeah. Before breaking Major League Baseball's color barrier and becoming the first black man to play in the big leagues, Jackie Robinson played second base for the Montreal Royals, a Brooklyn Dodgers farm team. Although Canada was not his country of origin and he didn't speak French, Robinson's memories of Montreal and its fans remained warm. He played 124 games with the Montreal Royals in 1946 before his history-making jump to the major leagues in 1947. Jackie Robinson's legacy can still be felt in Montreal to this day. Thanks for watching this episode of Outburst on CPAC. If you have any comments about this show or any other show, you can find us on social media. You can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca. I'm Glenn McGuinness, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Cable Public Affairs Channel, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.